My name is Omar El Arayan. I'm the co-founder and CEO at Clio Robotics, and I'm honored to be moderating this session this morning. We have a great panel of experts to discuss hard-earned capital, convincing investors to invest in your hardware startup, part of Startup Boston Week. Anyone who has ever gone through fundraising knows how difficult and time-consuming the process can be, especially for hardware companies. So in this session, we'll learn from the entrepreneurs on our panel about the strategies they deployed to successfully raise multiple rounds of funding, and from the venture capitalists on what they look for in a startup before writing a check. We'll also hear their thoughts on fundraising in a post-COVID world. We're going to start by taking a few moments for each of the panelists to briefly introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about their backgrounds. Then I'll kick off the conversation asking a few questions to get insight into how to formulate winning funding strategies. And then we'll open up the floor towards the end to give the audience an opportunity to ask a few questions. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our panelists and let's begin with each of them introducing uh, themselves in less than one minute. Uh, let's start with Katie. Hi there, I'm Katie Ray. I am the CEO and managing partner of The Engine. So we invest into what we call tough tech, which is inclusive of many hardware things or large systems. And uh, we are a fund and organization that uh, invests in breakthrough technology to solve what we think of as the world's biggest problems that technology can solve. Uh, and we are located in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We are deeply partnered with MIT where we spun out of. So we work on, uh, we work with founders coming out of university labs primarily that have really, really interesting technologies that could grow into very large businesses if, um, applied in the correct way. And a lot of those, almost all of those have what we think of as a physical instantiation. So most aren't consumer tech, but some are. Uh, most are, are large systems, really big pieces of hardware. And uh, so I understand how to fund and create companies like this and work really closely with founders. So thanks for having me today. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Leif? Thank you, Omar. A pleasure to be here today. Uh, my name is Leif Gentoft. I'm co-founder and chief strategy officer at Right Hand Robotics. Uh, we build a data-driven intelligent picking platform that provides flexible and scalable automation for predictable order fulfillment. Uh, generally speaking, the challenge that we're solving for our customers is as e-commerce explodes, it's getting very, very hard to try and find the labor to fulfill the orders predictably. Uh, if you look across the US, Right now, we've got about 36% annual turnover in the warehouses on average. I've spoken to warehouses where it's as high as 300% and spoken to other folks in the industry where they've seen 1300%. Uh, 20 to 30% absenteeism is quite common. And as customers are buying online during COVID days, uh, the customer experience hasn't reduced at all in its importance. Uh, we've got systems on the ground now uh, worldwide, three continents. Uh, we've done tens of millions of picks, and uh, that data set's really important for us for uh, building a differentiated product. Customers want reliability, trying to pick tens of thousands of items you've never seen before, and that's what allows our uh, systems to work well. Uh, we do have a hardware component to our barrier to entry. Uh, while we've got a lot of folks working on the software team, uh, our gripper technology spun out from a DARPA challenge about 10 years ago, and we do see that as a competitive differentiator and something that's a very key piece of what we play. By including the hardware in our value proposition, we can own the pick where we give much, the customers much better accountability that uh, will solve their business problem. So pleasure to be here today and appreciate the chance to speak. Excellent, thank you. Love the work you guys are doing. Um, Sydney? Hey, I'm Sydney McLaren. I am a partner at Material Impact, uh, who's a, a venture fund here in the Boston area. Uh, so we typically invest in uh, materials-based innovations. Uh, we like to be pretty early. Uh, we're company builders uh, by trade. I'm an engineer. Uh, all of my partners are engineers or material scientists. I um, mean, we so we so we really like to dive into uh, to really hard technologies. Um, my my sort of areas that I cover probably most closely um, are transportation, uh, industrial productivity. Um, and then a little bit of other sort of um, environmental sectors, if you will. Um, I, I sort of like to play in that area. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, we're really excited to, uh, to participate today. And um, thank you for having me. Excellent, thank you, what a great panel. 
Uh, Sydney, I'd like to start uh, with you and hear your thoughts on how COVID-19 has affected the venture capital space in general and whether it had any effect on your investment strategy. Yeah, well, I think, um, you know, on the positive side, I think a lot of our, um, for our, our investments, um, they're longer term, you know, so we were at the early stages of, of most of our investments. Um, and so we didn't really see a lot of, uh, you know, turbulence with those investments because they were so early, you know, they were sort of still, um, still in those, in those building stages. Um, for our portfolio companies who were, were going out to market, I mean, it was, it was a much tougher time. Um, and that's not to, that's not to say it wasn't tough on all of our portfolio companies, but certainly those who were, were closer to market, um, it was tougher. Uh, and I would say that, you know, in terms of impact, um, I would say it was, it was an adjustment, um, you know, just in terms of, of runway, right, in terms of making sure that you had a runway that was, uh, that was much longer than you maybe anticipated, uh, being able to adjust and think of um, talent, you know, on the, I mean, there was, you know, a lot of turnover in terms of, uh, in terms of um, people, you know, not being able to be hired, not stay on. And so thinking about your talent strategy uh, was the other sort of major component. I um, mean, then also thinking about your overall go-to-market strategy. You know, a lot of those go-to-market strategies that that you know we had sort of come to rely on for for several decades now uh, were disrupted. And so, thinking about those go-to-market strategies, rethinking them, retooling them, uh, were were sort of you know the three sort of major parts we saw in terms of in terms of changes for our for portfolio companies. So, do you think deal flow in general has been affected because of COVID in this space? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean. Um, you know, the interesting thing about COVID has been, uh, you know, it hasn't been a full shutdown, right? So there are, are, are several companies, you know, several sectors um, who are actually seeing increased activity, uh, you know, I mean, and they're the ones you know, right? So thinking about, you know, how do you work in a virtual environment, right? So anything in that space is now going much more quickly. Uh, you know, you think about how you, you know, how you move from, um, from a pre-COVID world to a post-COVID world, right? So anything that makes it easier for that, for that um, transformation, whether it's getting food deliveries, whether it's, you know, thinking about uh, robotics and how you can, you know, virtualize a, a workforce. Um, and so all of those things have been, have been much, uh, I would say, you know, increased activity. So in terms of deal flow for us, um, you know, it's been pretty even just because, you know, we, we invest in a lot of those areas. And so we still see a lot of deals coming through on those sides. Uh, but for some of the sectors that were, you know, more, more apt to being impacted by, by COVID and, and sort of the short-term changes, um, we certainly did see a drop off there. But I would say it evened out uh, with the increase in the other categories. Got it. Katie, uh, do you have anything to add to what Sydney said? And also, what advice would you give entrepreneurs that are fundraising in this challenging climate? Yeah, I mean, I don't think the capital markets are not shut down. Uh, and I think, you know, the difficulty, I'll, I'm going to start there and then go back to deal flow. So, you know, I think the difficulty for every general partnership that's doing investment is to figure out, do you have to meet people in person in order to invest? And if you do, how do you do that safely? Some people figured that out very, very quickly. Some people that has taken a while for which, which I think, and that's the same with their partnership. Like most partnerships meet in person, right? So do you feel comfortable making decisions when your partners are not in person or the entrepreneurs are not in person? So that was some hiccups there, but I think everyone's realizing this could go on for a long time. So you better make those decisions and get going, right? Uh, and, and so you saw kind of a three month lag there, I think, but now people are really understanding how to do that a little bit better. And then um, on the deal flow side, I think one of the interesting things is because a lot of the universities were shut down and the labs were shut down, there was an incredible amount of patent writing uh, and, and you know, business planning that people really didn't have time to do because they were running all their programs in their labs. And this gave them like kind of a forced shutdown on that and, and time to do those things. So we've seen and I think if you talk to the technology licensing offices, they would say the same thing. They've seen this huge surge in uh, potential ideas or potential companies. So now we've got to kind of process that bolus of, of ideas. It doesn't necessarily mean there are more startups, but it does mean that people have gotten a little bit more formal of, of their thinking around it, which is super cool and unexpected in some, some way. Yeah, absolutely. That's very interesting. So you're seeing like a burst of innovation 
coming out of this crisis? Well, yeah, you saw this like, well, first of all, everybody, including many, many startups, everybody went COVID, right? Anything they could do to help COVID, if they had that possibility, people really put effort into that. And so you saw that in the startups kind of pivoting, but you also start, saw that in the universities. So if you understood supply chain, you started thinking about COVID and supply chain. If you understood you know, vaccines, you started going there. If you understood, um, you know, how to manufacture PPE, you went there. So lots of kind of bursty activity in any way to help the crisis, right? And yeah. Uh, Leif, how has COVID affected your business uh, and maybe fundraising needs, if it has? So, so we're very lucky to be in an interesting sector. Uh, everyone is ordering online now. And so if you look in the cross the fundraising environment in the logistics automation, since the start of COVID, we've seen a bunch of companies that are actually raising additional money. Uh, Locus raised 40 million, Auto Motors raised 29 million. Uh, recently, just last week, Adabotics raised another round as well. And so I think we're lucky to be in a fairly strong sector for that. Uh, we did close a round in the middle of COVID, rate, COVID time ourselves. I think the ways that you build relationships with people vary a bit. Uh, and the specific uh, markers that you're looking for, for how do you show progress, how to give people a visceral sense of what's going on are also different. Uh, working in a place where you get physical demos, people love to see stuff in action. And so our uh, headquarters has been where essential services doing fulfillment. And so we've always had a staff that's been on site doing uh, building and things like that. But uh, as you're able to bring people by to be able to see stuff in person, that certainly helps. Uh, that may be limited groups now, and maybe you have a dinner that's outside rather than being able to go and sit a long time at a restaurant. But uh, I do think some amount of in-person interaction is very helpful for a lot of the other due diligence calls, the other uh, meetings, just, you know, one call instead of, uh, or one meeting that's in person instead of, you know, eight meetings that are in person. Uh, I think another main thing that we've seen is there's been a shift in the way that people are purchasing things. So... At the start of COVID, we had a lot of, or before COVID, we had a lot of retailers that were doing CapEx purchases. With COVID exploding, a lot of people are a little bit more nervous about deploying capital, but they're very interested to deploy operating expense. And so we've seen a lot of folks, including ourselves, shifting towards uh, offering a robots as a service model alongside the more traditional offerings. Uh, that's been very attractive to a lot of the 3PLs, and uh, we see that as a trend that's likely to continue to uh, move through the industry. Um, Sydney, what, what are the three most important criteria that you look for in a company before writing a check? Narrowing it down to three, huh? Um, yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> I know, I know <laughs> you know, um, you know, the biggest thing for me, uh, and the, the reason why I enjoy venture is really the people. Um, and so I, I mean, I can start there, you know, um, I mean, as you know, being in the in, in the startup community, it's it's a rare case that you know what you actually get pitched and what actually ends up coming out of the money that you funded uh, look exactly the same. Uh, and so, you know, the the biggest thing you're betting on uh, is that team to be resilient, to think about you know how they can uh, sort of pivot that model when they're you know when when things get tough, um, and how they can really support that you know along the along the journey of of the startup. And so, I think it really you know the foundation of this is really the people. Um, and, and all the other things sort of build on top of that, right? But I think, you know, the foundation is always, always the founding team and it always, always uh, the founders. Um, and I'll go a little further too. And in our particular cases, you know, in, in, in the case of hardware startups, um, it really takes some specific expertise to know how to build hardware, right? I think it's, you know, I don't think you can sort of bring somebody in who's just said, you know, hey, I, I did some type of startup, right? And then throw them into a hardware company. Um, there, there are some other challenges that I think that, that they will certainly learn, but but again, it's, it just takes time in terms of them being able to learn it. And so, you know, what one of the things I, I think about when I'm, when I'm investing in, um, in, in founders, again, especially in these sort of hard tech spaces, uh, is really having, you know, some basis of, of having a deep understanding on the team somewhere, right? It could be a CEO who's less technical, um, but has, is well supported by a technical team, or it could be a very technical CEO who's supported well by a business team. 
Um, but what I'm really looking for is having those um, having those those strengths and weaknesses balanced out by the team, and really having a core uh, sort of you know really technical ability to dive in um, and do the development uh, when it's needed. So, so that, that's sort of the team. Um, the other two aspects, you know, when I think about um, funding companies, uh, I think the second sort of you know second sort of one um, for me as an engineer is is does it work, <laughs> right? Which is um, which is is often overlooked, I think, in terms of you know, I think getting really excited about hey, here's the market opportunity and here's you know where this could go, et cetera. And I think um, fundamentally, you know, the biggest thing that I'm trying to get an understanding of up front um, is is this something where if it doesn't work right now, are they on the path to getting it work? Are they putting a play, plan in place um, that that gives me the confidence that it will actually work? Um, and, and am I investing in something that's you know sort of vaporware, right, and and not necessarily um, able to do what it said it does, but but it actually works at the end of the day. Um, and so I spent a lot of time thinking about that, um, and really dreaming with the entrepreneurs about what it could be. You know, I I always see what it is today, but my job is to sort of make that that something interesting in down the road, right? And that's what we're working hand in hand to do. Um, and so just understanding how that process might look, uh, getting an understanding, you know, that, that they are willing to put in the hard work to get that done. I, mean, I think it's, it's the second sort of place um, that I put that. But again, still ties back to ties back to the people. Um, and then I think that the you know the third big thing you know that I look at is really fit for the fund. Um, you know, when I think of investments, um, there are, are tons of good investments that I see that are just not a fit for for how we invest. They're not a fit for the skills that I can bring to the table in terms of helping them. Uh, and so, you know, my, my, my goal coming out of this is really just to have a happy, you know, marriage of skills where I can be helpful, where the rest of my partnership can be helpful. Um, and we have a broad, diverse skill set, but we can't do everything. Um, and, and we don't try to. Uh, and so, you know, being, making sure that it's an area where I can be actually helpful to them, uh, the partnership can be actually helpful to them, our relationships and networks can be helpful to them. Um, our advice can be helpful to them. And so thinking about areas where that, that fit is, is really there in terms of areas where we can be helpful, I think is, um, is really the third criteria, I would, I would say. Excellent. So, so to summarize, uh, it's the people, the technology, and the investment philosophy of, of your fund. Yep, exactly. All right. Um, everyone has heard a horror story where a company takes money from the wrong investor who ends up dictating a direction for the company that isn't necessarily in the best interest of the founders, and sometimes not even in the best interest of the business. Katie, what advice do you have for founders to avoid being in a situation like that? Well, I mean, listen, <laughs> there's a lot that can go wrong with startups and investors. So uh, I think, you know, the first thing is you really have to have a, a team, a plan, and a vision. Like if you don't have those three things, how you sort out your investors is pretty impossible. If you're confused about any of those or don't have those set, then picking the right investor becomes difficult. So if you have, let's say you have those, then I think your job as a founder is to make sure that you are aligned with your investors. So that's how your investors time frames, how they generally work with startups, because I think the way they've worked with startups in the past is probably very indicative of how they will work with the startups in the future. So um, then you have to match your capital needs with the kinds of check sizes that people write. So that's another mistake founders make all the time. They try to, you know, they, they think they want this you know, firm that only writes a round checks in general, and they write a little seed check to them and they think, oh yeah, I got, I got, you know, I got the best investment firm in the world, but really you didn't because that's not the check they write. They wrote you an option check. And so you start to get a lot of conflict, con conflict there, or you get a later round fund to write you a check and your metrics really weren't there, but they were afraid to miss out. And then they start really kind of pumping you to be at late B round rather than A round is where you are, right? So you got, you got real mismatches there that you see cause conflict. And then um, I think it's really important to talk about the role of independent directors and having a balance between, you know, founder management, independent directors and preferred investors. 
and how you shape that is super important to having a high functioning board. And most people don't talk about that because they've never run boards before. And so they don't really understand where those gaps are. And that's where trust is lost, right? And so I think most of the problems are just trust gaps and but they're really hard conversations right when you when you miss your numbers or you miss your your um launch right or your hardware has problems and you know your supplier in china didn't make the shipment and now you're out of money like these are all things that create trust gaps so if there's any misalignment it just like it gets exacerbated so what i just say to founders is like make sure your money fits your stage, make sure your philosophy of the board fits you and the kind of CEO you are, right? Some CEOs want to be in full control, like they need full throttle control. Others, super collaborative, want a lot of advice, want a lot of discussion about decisions. You gotta know who you are and you gotta surround yourself with people that aren't your yes people, will push you, but will work with you in a way that doesn't stress you out more. So that's, I mean, it's, there's no, this is, there's no exact answer here. This is all gray area. And this is the hardest part about venture and startups, but one that I think you should seek a lot of advice from different people, but then find what feels right to you as the founder, because that's the most important thing. But as what you're saying is, if I'm understanding correctly, it's a it's a mix of intuition, doing your research, um, and making sure the fund is the right match at the stage and philosophy. Yeah, and and working on your communication and your managing your feelings about what's happening. I I hate to bring that up, but I always say startups would be so easy if we didn't have to involve humans. Right. Uh, and so a lot of these mismatches are human communication errors. And a lot of it is they're really high stake games and your stress level, whether you're the board member be, and your reputation is on the line and your fund is pissed off at you because the investment doesn't look as good as you thought, or you're the CEO and things are going wrong. Like all of that raises our stress levels. And, um, ah, there's Rick. And I think it's working through those that is the magic of oh, no. having a great relationship Hello. with your board members. Excellent. Hey, Rick. Rick. Hello, Rick. It is Rick. <laughs> Rick, can you hear us? All right, we'll come back to Rick in a few minutes here. Um, many entrepreneurs, especially first time founders are very sensitive to the idea of giving up too much equity. Uh, Leif, how can a founder strike a balance between not diluting too much of his or her equity and raising enough capital to ensure the ability to grow and expand, especially that hardware companies are generally more capital intensive than other types of businesses like software, for example. A lot of the question really comes down to what Katie was talking about with having a proper plan, estimate how long it's going to take to reach different milestones. You really raise money against, you don't want to boil the ocean. So a lot of the skill of doing a startup is breaking it up into pieces of that, that you can achieve and then, uh, then use that to uh, get additional resources to pursue the next stage. Uh, I think generally speaking, if you misestimate how much capital you're going to need to take to get to the next stage, that's really where the major dilution comes. And so I think self-control around how much you're going to, how much concern you have about giving up equity for a, a first stage is important because that means that you don't give up a much larger portion at a later stage of the company. I think for hardware systems, it always takes longer than you'd expect it's going to take to try and build things. I think too, uh, it's not a zero sum game where uh, there are people that are brilliant at fundraising 
and there are people that are brilliant at operating companies. Uh, you get some people that are brilliant at both. We've got Rick on the board here on the call here as well. Uh, but uh, I think the uh, skills of uh, how do you go about pulling that in is that you can really raise enough to cover not only what you thought it was going to be, but what the risk is if the prototype didn't work as well as you thought it was going to be, or your QA process turns out you needed some extensive uh, additional work that you hadn't expected, or if you have to do a recall because you realize that there was a uh, issue with something that uh, wasn't working the way that you thought it was going to. Uh, I think it's really important to have enough capital that you've got the flexibility to, uh, to pursue that well. Excellent, thank you. Rick, can you hear us now? Yeah, I can hear you great. Sorry, I apologize, I was running late. I, uh, uh, somehow I, I uh, thank you, uh, Katie, for getting me on this thing. I, I totally lost track uh, of, of, of this, so I apologize. I had a bunch of stuff going on. I, I would say that on that particular question that Leif uh, answered is, it really depends on your circumstances. I remember the first company that I raised money for, it was 50K at 500 pre, and then I raised half a million at one pre, and then it was like, I don't know, it was like a, a long slog and, and it was still had a lot of equity when I was done and it was worth more than I ever thought I'd make and I was in my 20s. So I would say I would never focus on dilution. I'd focus on getting things done and finding the right people to get on your company to help you build the business versus like a... Uh, waste uh, six months or a year. You, the one thing you don't have is time because all the people are doing the same thing you're doing around the world. People have the same ideas at the same time and they're not really worth much until you reduce them to practice and get customers, which is what really matters at the end of the day. Excellent. And to those in the audience who, who don't know you, uh, can you give them a, maybe a 30 second or one minute uh, introduction, please? Yeah, so uh, entrepreneur uh, doing a company called Desktop Metal. It's process of going public now and uh, you know, this would be my second company going public. Uh, that's kind of at a north of a billion dollar price, and uh, have a background in in material science and hardware related businesses, and uh, did software before in my life, and spent five years doing investing in a bunch of the companies that I invested in. Uh, ended up uh, selling for decent multiples. So, uh, basically, technology entrepreneur. Uh, kind of in frontier technologies. Uh, Excellent. Uh, Rick, if you could go back in time several years, your early days at, at uh, Desktop Metal, or maybe the early days of your first startup, what advice would you give yourself, uh, knowing what you know now, that you think could have impacted your fundraising in a big way, maybe made it easier or more successful at certain points, or maybe even helped you avoid some, some mistakes? Well, I have to say I sucked at fundraising when I was young and I got better with time. So it's an acquired skill set and everybody gets better at it with time and experience, uh, especially if you're able to close around. If you can't ever close around, that's kind of never really get to learn the process. But if you close one round and then the other one and then the other one, it's different depending on the stage that you're raising, if you're raising for angels versus real investors. And I, I think I'm lucky that I always had investors that were active, they were on our boards, et cetera, versus some there's been a, a complete, uh, people have gotten very lax, um, the investment space is particular where, where they, you can raise some angel money, but you don't really get a, a board member and then you re don't really learn anything and you think you know everything and you end up with a, a, um, you know, sort of a skewed view of the world that that's from blogs and hacker news and Reddit posts from people that had never done anything opining on stuff. And so the, I would say um, if you're on a journey, don't be afraid to just like catalyze something and get it done and start executing building your product, which is what really matters versus try to tweak everything, and make it perfect. And then you get better with time. In this company, we had a pretty experienced team that had done a lot of stuff when we started. So the fundraising was not the challenge, but we were trying to build stuff that nobody else had done. So the technical side, you know, we, we had a lot of uh, technical, uh, um, engineering uh, developments that we had to figure out how to do like, like you know, material science driven and there you're fighting with nature. Uh, so I think sometimes uh, you, you don't control timelines, but, but we've been lucky that we've been able to get a bunch of products out and build global distribution. Our products are now available in 60 countries around the world and at scale. So yeah, love the guys, the work you guys are doing. Um, before I take questions from the audience, if there's one thing you would like 
this audience take away from this session? What would it be? I'd like to hear from everyone, maybe starting with uh, Katie. Do something really big. Do something you care about really big uh, and find as many allies as possible. I, I think I'll echo what Rick said, which is, especially here in Boston, there is a deep bench of people who've done extraordinary companies that are here to help and reach out, you know, and, and but think big because <laughs> life is short and we got a lot of things that need to be fixed in this world. And so, you know. I love that. I love that. Oh. Um, I would say don't go out alone. I mean, I, I see, you know, probably, you know, too many people who are 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 sort of just, you know, think about it as sort of this Lone Ranger mentality, um, and they they don't build a team around them to be able to support, you know, what their vision is, their idea, um, and the team is really, you know, who who gets it done. And so, I would really say just, you know, just make sure you don't go it alone. I mean, feel free, you know, feel feel comfortable sharing your ideas, feel comfortable sharing them within, you know, communities like Startup Boston and and other areas. Um, where you have the opportunity to network with you know with all these smart people and and you know people who are, are good resources for you as you as you try to build your company i um, mean so yeah just make sure you make sure you you know don't uh don't forget that you're not on an island um that you have a bunch of other people there um and and put some people around you who you who you trust and who can help you get it done excellent uh Leif? yeah i'd second what sydney said about the ask the S expert operator being really strong a lot of people building hardware, building hard tech companies have a really deep expertise. They're used to being the expert in the field and they're the ones who knows all the answers. As you build a company out, you don't, there's a lot of things you don't yet know. Uh, how good is good enough to ship for customer feedback? What's really the most important thing to focus on in your fundraising deck? Things like that. And so recruiting people to try and patch in those areas of expertise is extremely, extremely important. It lets you get towards uh, solving customer problems faster and it lets you get towards uh, answering not only the technical questions, but also the business questions uh, much more quickly. And uh, as Rick said, there's uh, time is the only thing you don't have. Great. Rick? Um, I mean, I'm assuming the folks here, if there's a panel about how do you fundraise, this is a bunch of folks that, that haven't done it before. So I would say that don't, uh, uh, there, you know, there's a lot of people think that things gotta be cute, you know, they call this a, uh, call it what would traditionally be a series A, a seed round. So the things like that, that whole thing doesn't make any sense. Uh, I, I would say um, try uh, try to find, uh, if you're gonna go venture, it's okay to get good VCs involved early and give them a meaningful equity stake so that they you have people with reserves uh, to support the company long run in follow on rounds versus angels who can't really help you raise capital in the, in the next round. Um, there are exceptions to the rule always, like, you know, there's really great funds like uh, uh, Founder Collective that, that uh, have a kind of a different strategy and they, they position it as being aligned with you on getting you the highest price in the following rounds, whatever. But I mean, that, that to me, I think is a bit marketing is what they want is the highest multiple long run for their funds. But um, whereas other funds that realize that uh, they want to have a uh, long, uh, you know, that, that it, sometimes you need to step in and, and like participate along all the, all the financings to take a business, you know, make it successful long run. But either way, I mean, these are all really good people But I would say go venture early because you, you increase your chances of success. If you can't do that and you have to sort of go to angel investors up front, uh, I think, I think that uh, don't be afraid to like just catalyze stuff so that you can start to execute, which is what really matters. None of this fundraising stuff matters. What you really want is successful customers in high margin products to make customers successful. So sure. there's nothing wrong also with bootstrapping. If you don't want you to do that. that some, some angel investors can be very valuable, especially at a very early stage. Like who? Like somebody who's built a company, for example, who's been in it, uh, who's they're, done. They're very valuable. They're very busy and they don't have time to spend time. And like, I, I mean, I, I, I think it's, um, it's a fallacy that you have this like, ooh, they're more experienced than VCs or whatever. It's like, I think that's a bunch of baloney. 
there are some great angel investors and they help early stage companies, but it's a bunch of Mickey Mousery. You, you, if you can get an EA or Sequoia to give you money on a seed round, that's way better than getting like Samil Shah to give you some sprinkles here and there. Uh, and these are all good people. So then I'm not uh, saying that they're ones are better than the others. What I'm trying to say is that you get in your cap table, somebody that's got reserves and is going to help you build your company at a completely different level long-term. And uh, I think that uh, when people in later stages are trying to put money in, in, in a company that want to have people in the early stages that actually have reserves to follow on in all the future financings. And that's what really you want to try to build a, an investor base of long only investors. If you're trying to create a compounding durable security. You, you are much better off having it with solid uh, capital on it than, than folks that are now there is a place for angels because the truth is if you, if you're inexperienced and don't have a track record and you're doing it for the first time, they are the people that come in and, and step in and support you and and like thank God that they exist. You know, like my first investors were angels. That's right. And then the next company, I didn't have angel investors because they were a pain in the ass. They wanted right. to have too much value, which means like, you, you know, you kind of know what you're doing. But like, if you run a company and you got a guy calling you every other day with like all sorts of cocomamini ideas that don't make any sense, and they don't really understand your business, they're all nervous where they're going to lose their money because it's like real money for them. It's got it. not really like the best investor. Now, there are these super angels that have intros and all these two VCs if you're not connected and that's fine. They, there is a place for all of this in the startup world. Um, I have kind of a, a contrarian view from what you read in the mainstream press that it's like, if you can go get venture right away, you're way better off. If you can't get venture because your stuff's just not mature enough and you don't have the credibility to like get the proper intros or the you know, convince somebody how to pitch it properly, then do the angel thing and demonstrate customers and then do the, like, you do what you can. Like, we're entrepreneurs are all beggars. I mean, like all entrepreneurs, me included. And so my view is beggars can't be choosers. So sure. we, we're yeah. raising money. So you, you do the best you can at the stage you're at in life and it gets That's better true. over time. Got it. Katie, do you agree with what Rick said is uh, go for a fund that has you know, very deep pockets, someone like a Sequoia with a big uh, brand name. And or an NDA or whatever. Like if you can, yeah, that's what you should go for. Anyway, I'll, I'll yeah. try it out. Katie, Katie was, you know, Katie, um, so you, you had talked earlier about how uh, you have to be very careful with selecting a venture fund. So maybe don't, you know, if the philosophy is not exactly in line or the stage is not in line, don't do it. Um, should entrepreneurs look and say, well, it's Sequoia Capital, so maybe I should just do it or stick to what you said earlier? I mean, I think everything is driven by the partner you're working with and the firm you're working with. Sequoia, I, how could you say something bad about Sequoia? There are absolutely stunning returns and, and very, very good partners there. Uh, not everyone's going to get Sequoia's money. And there are a lot of good alternatives to Sequoia. But I think Rick's point about you need to understand the depth of the capital that each fund has. And I think most entrepreneurs don't understand that. And there are funds like we mentioned, Founder Collective, whose, whose model is to do one round and then help you raise the next round. That is perfectly legit model because they're really good at it. Um, but don't confuse the two types of capital. So there's deep pocketed, super long, and then there's not. And I think it depends who you are. It depends if you have a track record, how big your vision is, how convincing you are, whether that will depend on what kind of capital you're gonna get. No matter what kind of capital you get, there are ways to keep getting better as you go, but that is gonna rely on your progress. And so that's the problem with like, often people raise too little money in the beginning, they do a super small round, they can't make enough progress and then hit themselves, you know, then they do a flat round, then they do another flat, then that's a recap and then it's a disaster. So you've got to keep matching the progress you need to make on meaningful milestones with the amount of capital you need. And so, but 
there isn't just one way to do it. So I, I, you can't say it's Sequoia or a bust or NEA or bust. And I love both of those firms, but there are lots of people with models that you know, know how to do lab translation or are very good in a certain area. They might be good at security or they might be good at consumer. Um, and make sure that the partner you're working with loves you, that their career is riding on you in a good way, and that they know either how to get that capital and have a track record of doing it or have the capital themselves. And you're pretty sure they have the juice in the firm to get money toward you. So that's, that's maybe a little bit more color on what Rick said, but no full, no real disagreement with Rick, but it's just reality is very few people are going to get Sequoia's money. Thank you. Uh, it's a good segue to uh, our first uh, question from the audience. What investors or VC funds in robotics and autonomous systems do you personally respect and look up to as a role model, apart from Sequoia, obviously? Um, Leif? There's a lot of folks doing very interesting stuff in this space. Uh, right there's, uh, for example, THL recently raised a fund. They're probably later stage than mostly seed stuff. They're, you know, Series A, Series B but they have very interesting things going on. Uh, F prime is also doing some interesting work in that area. Uh, we of course have raised money from playground global. They've got a very experienced team and uh, very good connections, especially out to the hardware community and uh, manufacturing space meeting all another Boston area startup has uh, done some very good stuff with uh, their connections through Foxconn, et cetera. Uh, I think you look at uh, some of the ones that Rick mentioned as well. Of course, they all have robotics presence. NEA has done some interesting work in this space. Uh, I'd be happy to provide a list if there's a distribution uh, there's afterwards. Tons of firms. I think uh, Jeff uh, at Fly, Flybridge had a good list of investors in Boston for a long time that he used to publish every year. If you look, yeah. they don't change that much. But there's tons of venture capital out there, like tons of venture capital. Yeah. You, the key is just go go talk to founders of those companies and have those guys do the interest versus cold calling. That's yes, cold yes. So just get get. Uh, sort of the people invest through a network versus, um, you know. And if you're lucky, you might get them to give advice on a, on a pitch deck. I think, uh, Rick, I remember uh, our meetings early on and uh, the uh, help that those were towards uh, our, our fundraising process. So strongly agree, it should come through the network. Uh, also as well, talk to, if you're considering an investment from one of these firms, do your due diligence with other founders that they've invested in. Uh, there's all the stuff that uh, Katie mentioned around vision match for what they are investing in the stage of the firm. There's also management interface as well, where are they, do they really do a good job of what they're wanting to do? Are they founder friendly? Omar, I, I apologize, but I, I, uh, I don't know how I ended up in this panel uh, somehow, but, but thanks for Katie for sending me the, the info. Uh, and I think people threw, threw this on my calendar. And, uh, and so here I am. Uh, I do have to uh, run for a 10, a, 10 a.m. thing, uh, but I'm available, Rick Fullop at desktopmetal.com and happy to help anybody that has questions or is looking to, is any, any, anything interesting in hardware, I'm interested in, in, cause that's what I do. So please Thank reach you, out any, anytime. Thank you, I apologize for the, the, the like a, a, a disorganized nature of my entry and exit here. Uh, Perfect. Sorry, Rick, it's that. so good to see you again. And right. congratulations on all of the uh, progress with desktop. It's super exciting. Yeah. Yeah. All right, take our next question here. Uh, has, has COVID helped convince investors on the value of robotics? Um, Sydney? Um, I think we were already convinced before <laughs> you know, in terms of, uh, in terms of the value. I mean, I think it, you know, I will say it accelerated a lot of the need, uh, you know, certainly, um, certainly like, you know, the, the, the um, uncertainty in the workforce, right, I think it's much higher right now. And so you have a lot more of, of the oscillations in terms of, you know, being able to maintain consistency. So I think it, I think it accelerated a lot of the things we were thinking, but trend wise, you know, I don't think it really changed much at all, right? I think it's, um, I think it still centers around uh, having talented people uh, in your workforce who are getting things done and trying to figure out how you can surround them with 
uh, the best tools available to be able to amplify the amount they're able to do, right? And so I think it's less about like, um, you know, how can I sort of replace people and, and, you know, replace them with machines and more, how can I identify my highest performers? How can I, you know, support those people with, uh, with automation that makes their lives easier, that allows them to, you know, be more productive and really, and really do more. Um, and so surrounding those high performers is, is, you know, what we believed anyway. Um, and so being able to do that, uh, I don't think COVID has, you know, changed that, it, but it has certainly accelerated it in terms of um, just because there are now some, some oscillations in terms of, of being able to get those high performing people and, and now having a gap uh, between, you know, the amount of, of high performing people that you need. Uh, and then now how do you fill that? How do you fill that gap? Excellent. Um, take another question. How do you get the interest of risk averse investors in medical device hardware companies that need years before they can get FDA clearance to sell their product? Um, Katie? Wrong mindset. Uh, risk aversion and risk taking. I mean, like you're already thinking about it the wrong way. So if somebody's a no, on to the next investor. You got to be thinking about shaping your vision to be a huge company so that it is worth taking the risk on time frame, and that's how you have to uh, formulate your pitch because plenty of people will do it. And all entrepreneurs, it's like wildfire, like, oh, everybody's against medical device investing. It's not true. You just have to find the people that are for it. And you've got to shape your pitch so that more people will be for it. Take control back. When you say the market is against you, you're already in the wrong mindset. Just take your control back. You're just seeking, you're seeking the people who love you. And there's lots of money and lots of people are gonna love your idea. It's your job to eliminate and not spend time on your nose. Great. Cindy, can you speak to the investment criteria for material companies and how do you measure traction? I, I, I'm sure you can go into a lot of detail, but uh, if you could keep it brief, please. Yeah, yeah of course. Um, so I think, I mean, traction within, it depends on the stage, right? So, you know, traction at the very early stage, I think is, is, you know, you thinking about building out a solid IP portfolio, you know, having a, a clear uh, sort of innovation that I think you can build on and then, and then moving from there. And so traction isn't always, you know, sort of customers at the earliest stage, although the earlier you can get them, the better. Uh, but, you know, when you're bringing a, a technology, you know, directly out of a university or something like that, you often won't have uh, this customer base, uh, you know, at the beginning. And so traction may look different uh, in, the, in that particular case. Um, but once you get out sort of outside of that phase, I mean, traction is, is really back to, you know, your normal metrics, right? It's really back to, you know, how many customers are you getting? Um, what is the progress that you're making in terms of, in terms of uh, innovation gains and your product? And how are you delivering more value to those customers? Um, and I think it is, you know, it is pretty, um, you know, there are a lot of conversations about, you know, sort of hardware being different in, in a lot of cases, and it definitely is. But I think those core values of how are you delivering value to the customer, I think stays the same in terms of, in terms of traction. And so th that's what we're really measuring is, are you, are you valuable to those customers? Um, are you delivering value? Um, can we, you know, verify that? Um, and if you're delivering value to, to the customers, even if it's a few and you're delivering really great value to those customers and there are other people who look like them, then that, that might be better than, you know, you saying, hey, I delivered a very small amount of value to 10 customers uh, and now, you know, those customers likely are not likely to return and maybe only two of those of those return, right? So thinking about value at the end of the day. So how, how do you validate that that traction or interest or, or a technology that, you know, does some sort of benefit to the customer uh, the difference between a, a need to have and a nice to, and a nice to have. Yeah, I think you have to talk to the customers, right? The customers are, are you know, are very, I mean, they're busy, right? They're very, very much uh, focused on their, their products. Um, and so you'll be able to, you know, in a short conversation, you, you can get a very clear picture of whether this is something, you know, that they're saying, hey, this is a nice to have. Um, or it's something that they're like, hey, you know, if I, if you took this away from me tomorrow, then, you know, I would be very disappointed because this would really, really impact my business. How I does mean, an investor determine yeah. that? So from you can talk to the customer. 
Okay, so that's you, you just call up those customers and talk. Yeah, to them. yeah. I mean, again, it's part of the due diligence process of part of the you know these conversations of. I mean, you you just talk. You have to talk to the customers to understand you know their real pain points because if, if that part of the diligence, if you don't if you don't do it, then you don't really have an understanding of what what those customers are doing. And so, as an investor, we talk to them, right? If you have customers that, that you think are interesting, you know, we look at them. Um, and then we talk to the entrepreneurs and there's a bit of trust, you know, going on in terms of if the entrepreneur is, you know, you can ask them questions and understand uh, what their what their perception of the value is. But then validating that with the customers, um, I think, be between the two is, is really helpful. So you're not necessarily looking for purchase purchase orders or pay pilots or letters of intent. It could be just a conversation with the customer. Yeah, it depends on the state. Can I just point out one thing? You got to be really careful as the entrepreneur. You got to be pretty deep with an investor before you should want them to talk to your customers. Because if they turn you down, how many investors are you going to let do that? So just, that's, sorry, Sydney, to interject, but. No, it's totally fine. And again, and again, like I said, I mean, it's part of our process, right? So for us, of, of you know, when we're at the end of the stage, right, and we're looking at like final basically checks that we're looking at, we basically have those customer conversations, but I think that, you know, the level of trust in the beginning is sort of what we're looking at. Um, and like you said, I mean, there are other positive signals that you could find before you get to that later stage of, of the due diligence, right? In terms of you can look at POs, you can look at, you know, customer orders, you can look at their uh, their customer pipeline, you can look at a bunch of other things to get that, that indication. But before I actually write the check, I actually want to talk to some of those customers and, and sort of verify that, right? I think that that's, for me personally, that, that's just something that I, I like to do before I write checks. Uh, and so, you know, some investors, I think, might not want to do that. Um, but I think that that's how we think about it in terms of verifying that as a final check. And so putting all that together, I think, gives you a pretty, pretty clear picture. Got it. Thank you. Hey, uh, Omar, I think yeah. we have time for maybe one more brief question, and then uh, we're going to have to pass it along. Great. All right, uh, last question. Do VCs generally view um, B2C or consumer hardware companies as too risky to invest in? And if so, what could make these companies more attractive? Um, Katie? Nest. 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 Nest brought the VCs a lot of money. So no, the answer is uh, people will invest into anything they think is gonna be an enormous business and return capital. That is your job. Stop, again, wrong mindset. You know, you gotta find the investors, you gotta have the vision. Um, do you agree that uh, VCs generally view hardware in general as being hard and consumer hardware being especially hard? Uh, no, I think all those perceptions are kind of BS. I mean, think about it. They also view every new consumer app as hard. They also view every system structure as hard. Everything's hard. Um, everything has its advantages. And, but people, people perpetuate these perceptions because they, of all the blogs out there, oh, hardware is hard. Are they? Yeah, yes, hardware has its difficulties. Your job is to understand the difficulties and have a plan of action that skirts around those difficulties, whether it's supply chain or upfront capital. And the only way around that is to understand the opportunity at play and why that could be a huge success. That is your job as the entrepreneur to show that. So stop all the perceptions that this is hard or investors don't do that. They don't do it because they don't see a business plan that works and they don't see a team that could pull it off. Excellent. Thank you, Katie. All right, I think we're uh, nearing the end of the hour here. So I'd like to thank our panelists for taking the time to be here this morning and share their valuable insight into how entrepreneurs can successfully fundraise for their hardware startups. And I hope uh, everyone in the audience will walk away from this panel knowing two or three insights that will hopefully uh, help them going forward with their fundraising efforts. So with that, uh, thank you again. I'd like to turn it over to Andy.